Hi and welcome to the fourth video in my uh, homemade pipeline CPU build. So in the last video we were looking at, uh, at this count register which is the uh, it's a cut down lower eight bits of, uh, of one of our address registers and this circuit which is basically assembled for for testing some bus logic. So at the moment this uh, eight strand ribbon cable is a stand in for our bus and whatever's on the bus is displayed on these green LEDs so I can have an output from either these switches via this 74LS541 line driver chip that comes from from here or I could connect it to these eight lines are, that are the outputs from our, uh, our counter register. I can also connect this uh, cable to the input of my count register, output from my switches and do a load. Okay, so that's great, but um, we would like to, uh, to be able to connect both of these simultaneously. So, as I mentioned before, we could use one of these line driver chips, but um, I saw a, a problem with that, which I'm uh, I'm going to explain to you now. So, if we think about our uh, our clock as hopefully a, a nice clean square wave where each cycle of our clock is, uh, is one of these divisions. Now, if we were developing a, 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 a stepped processor architecture rather than the pipelined one, we would have um, a lot of flexibility with, with what was going on because let's say we might increment the program counter here and then assert the address out onto the bus here in the next cycle. But um, what I'm trying to do here is generate a, a, a near scalar processor where um, potentially in each cycle we would increment the program counter and read an instruction out of memory. So this is uh, this makes things a little bit more difficult for us. At the moment, we uh, we're, we're increasing the the count on the rising edge of the clock. So if I press my single step button, we uh, we see the number increment, and so far as we can see, that's that's instantaneous. But, um, but I don't think it actually is. We have a series of four of these, uh, these counter chips in the full 16-bit register. And between each of those is the borrow and carry lines. And then we've got the, uh, the main increment and decrement lines coming into a, the, the far right-hand side. And then out of each of these we've got our four address lines that make up our 16-bit address. Now on the rising edge of the increment line here this register is going to or this counter is going to start to change. But before we do that it's going to have one number out here and when we uh, when we raise the line here, um, it will count up, but there's going to be a, a period of time in which uh, we can't really be certain on what the output of these pins are. So if we imagine we've got this, this cycle here, we want to be reading from one address, and then in this cycle here we want to be reading from the next address sequentially in memory, then uh, we've potentially got a problem. So if we, as we currently are, if 
if we perform the increment on the rising edge here, then this uh, count chip is going to start to, to perform its, its function internally and we're going to have a period of time where we're not really sure what's coming out of this chip but then if that's an increment and this is at 15 that's also going to be raising the, the carry line here which is the increment to the next chip so we've got the, the next chip could be in a slightly indetermined state for a, for a period of time and we've got four chips in a row here so that's uh, whatever this delay is it's, uh, it's going to be four times higher and when we looked at the data sheet for, for the chips that we're currently using they said they could run at 40 megahertz now to me that suggests that uh, if this this square wave clock were 40 megahertz it would be confident in resolving all of its outputs by the end of this period but that means that the entire clock cycle we're not really very sure on what's coming out of these pins so uh, that's going to be a problem for us so if we were running at a couple of hundred kilohertz we'd probably be absolutely fine we could increment here and treat it as pretty much instantaneous because the vast majority of this time the lines will all be settled and we'd have the the, the number we want coming out on the bus but uh, I would like to uh, get this thing going as fast as we can so we have to worry about that so as we increase the clock rate this uh, this period of unsureness where we don't quite know what's coming out on the bus is going to stretch out across this clock cycle until the whole thing um, breaks down completely. So what I'm interested in doing is uh, is taking away that uh, that period where we're we're unsure. And the thing that I, f I find most scary about this is uh, most of our increments are only going to affect this chip. In fact, 15 out of 16 of them are only going to affect the, these lower four bits. So we'll have the minimal period of uh, indeterminate output. But if there's a carry, we get the next slice. And then if there's a carry from that, we'll get the next slice. This is 1 in 16 here, 1 in 256 here, 16 times less frequently up here. And it's, it's kind of a little bit scary here because we could very easily find ourselves in a position where we have a circuit which works absolutely fine at uh, addresses within one of these 16 or 256 byte boundaries but when we try and execute an instruction that goes over the boundary and the carries are, are rippling up to the, the higher order bits that uh, we start to see some uh, erratic behavior which would be very worrying okay so what can we do now so looking around the the list of available chips and I came across this one so this is the 74 LS 574 it's a octal D type flip-flop with tri-state outputs now we know from uh, looking at the line driver that these uh, tri-state outputs are what we want because it would allow us to uh, have multiple sets of output on the bus and as long as we only uh, enable one at a time that's uh, that's going to be nice and stable but uh, it has eight flip-flops inside it which we can pretty much treat as uh, as, as latches which uh, are going to store their, their bits of data actually read this data sheet here it says uh, this device is functionally identical to the 74LS374 except for the pinouts if you uh, if you go and look at that version it's uh, it's it's horrible the uh, inputs and outputs are uh, all over the place on the chip so uh, particularly on a breadboard it would be quite complicated but uh, this one has all the inputs on one side and all the outputs on the other side in nice numerical order which does make us um, a lot happier on a breadboard. So, um, usual VCC and ground on opposite sides. We've got our eight inputs, our eight outputs. 
Um, we've got a output enable, which is active low, as we're getting used to seeing. And we've got this, uh, this copy line. So if we look back on here and think about the behavior we'd like to see. So at the moment, we're incrementing on the rising edge of the clock. And instead, what I think we should be doing is on the rising edge of the clock, we should activate that copy line. And then if we want to increment in this cycle for the next cycle, we'll do that on the, the falling edge of the clock cycle. And that means that we have this nice big period of time here for whatever these chips are doing to, uh, to, com to complete their work, settle on their outputs, and then on the, the rising edge of the clock, if we have the, uh, the, the flip-flop chip here, we uh, activate the copy line. Obviously we'll, only, we'll have eight of these inputs, so we'll need two of these chips for each 16-bit bus. But uh, those eight lines will be copied into the latch where they can uh, uh, spend the entire cycle here being pushed out onto the bus if, uh, if that's the value we want on, on any of the buses. Okay, so let's look at getting that, uh, that chip into this circuit. Right, so there's our eight inputs coming here, our eight outputs there. Ground line. A little bit of bad planning here. I've got a, got a power line that doesn't go straight up. Okay, so then this one will be our copy, and if we bring that high, it will be copying all the time, so it will effectively work uh, like the, the bus transceiver, or, and then on the output enable, if we bring that low, and connect our, uh, our bus. We'll get the output from the count register over here. Oh, actually, no, we don't. Ah, oh, no, this uh, this is going to just copy on the on the rising edge. That's uh, that's good. Okay, so let's have a think about what's going on here. If I take this and we plug that into a clock, then the output is, that's actually interesting. We're actually seeing the behavior we wanted for already. Now that implies that um, we're successfully getting the output from the previous increment cleanly on the stored in the latch but I was very unsure about this and I still am unsure about the behavior as we increase the clock because if we copy the contents of the register on the rising edge at exactly the same time as we um, start the uh, the increment then we're, we're, we're right on the line there of getting some indetermined behavior. So instead I want to move the increment over to our inverted clock. So we increment on the falling edge of the main clock cycle here, which I think will be a lot more stable. So here we go. Yeah, that's what we wanted. So the current address in this register, when I push the clock down, 
is what is available on the bus if we're selecting that register. And then when I lift the switch is when the increment happens. Obviously in the final circuitry this isn't going to be driven directly from the clock, this is all going to be control lines, but um, uh, for all intents and purposes this is a, a very effective way of testing it. Okay, I like that. So we're, we're very sure about what values are being read and what values are being incremented and we don't have any any periods of time within the clock cycle where uh, where we've got a race condition to worry about. So if I take this line high it will stop pushing this register onto the bus. If I take this line low then the switches get put onto the bus. So this is a stand-in for some other register. But I'm, I'm being quite cautious when I do this though because um, this is actually a little bit of a problem in that were I to assert both these values and these values onto the bus at the same time then any bits that are different between the two would, um, would be a situation where we're, we have a, a line on the bus where one chip is trying to drive it high and one chip is trying to drive it low and that would be really bad because um, that those chips are going to be sinking um, or sourcing as much current as they can and would have a you know something would give sooner or later or at least get hot so we need to think about ways that we can improve that um, so effectively I want with this two register situation I want um, only one to be low at a time. So if I were to make one of these um, enable lines the opposite of the other then uh, that would be a little bit neater. So I think a solution would be to use one of the spare inverters up here. If we just quickly look back at the inverter chip so, okay, so we're not yet using this one here on pins 5 and 6. So if I take this enable line, put that into there, and then use that as the enable there, then this line here, if it's high, getting the count register and obviously we're seeing this slightly out of phase on the bus from uh, what's actually in the count register or if I switch that the other way I get the output from the switches okay that's excellent okay so we're, we're, we're very sure about what's going on here the value from the register is present on the bus for the entire cycle that we want it to be. We've got um, a nice comfortable period of time for this increment to happen in um, if we've chosen to have an increment in that cycle. And we've got a basic mechanic here where only one of these two devices will output onto the bus at a time. Two registers isn't enough though, we need more than that. Um, so if we actually think about it just on here we've got uh, um, we've got a load line which we're going to have on all of the registers we've got a assert to bus line on this register we've got an increment and a decrement then so you know, that's an awful lot of lines when we multiply it out by uh, by all of the 16 bit registers we're planning to have so in the next video what we're going to look at is is ways of managing those lines because this use just use of the inverter here it works for our two registers but it's uh, it's not going to scale to uh, what I'm expecting to be eight registers on the address bus but uh, that's a good place to finish today and uh, thanks for watching
Goodbye.